Okie doke. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Puente. I am one of the um, evangelists for Adobe Creative Cloud here at the University of Arizona. And today, our workshop is about creating an AR showcase with Adobe Arrow. In this workshop, we will be using... It's iTunes is bouncing here. Uh, in this workshop, we will be using... Um, the stock assets inside of Adobe Arrow. So there's nothing that you have to download. Um, I will probably briefly jump into Photoshop and show you how to, how I built layers that interact well with Adobe Arrow. It's pretty straightforward and pretty easy to do. We may even try and build one ourselves if there's time. Um, but basically the name of the game is to get you acquainted with Adobe Arrow. I really liked this raccoon, which is why I chose it for our workshop mascot for today. Um, but like I said, all of our starter assets will be here. And on our Spark page, which has been linked in the notes and will be linked on the uh, video recording, um, you can see our agenda here. Um, and it's a lot of, whenever you're doing, working with Arrow, it's really about a few things, understanding how the interface works, bringing in assets, adding some interactive elements to them. And then um, finally, um, working on, uh, sharing those assets out so that people can view them and enjoy them. Uh, so basically, uh, if you're not familiar with it, Adobe Arrow is a point and click kind of design based way to do, to create AR experiences. Um, with AR, typically you're using a screen to view elements uh, that show up kind of in a real world context. Um, so it's a pretty cool technology. I will show you kind of what it looks like on iPad uh, later, although it does slow down a little bit, um, but we'll mainly be working in Adobe Arrow beta, which is a part of uh, Creative Cloud. And I'll show you how to get that here in a moment. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Let me go move this out of the way. And then we're gonna go ahead and open up Adobe Arrow. No, I don't choose my phone. Cool, all right, sweet. So when you launch Adobe Arrow, if you haven't launched it before, you'll be greeted with this kind of home screen that says, let's create some mind-bending AR experiences. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and open up Adobe Arrow. We're, we're gonna create a new project. I do have kind of a nearly finished project that we'll get to later. We might bounce back and forth between, but we're gonna create a new project. We're gonna bring in and we're gonna bring in an element and then we're gonna kind of walk through the interface real quick. If that sounds okay there. And again, if you have questions, please ask them in chat. We would love to answer them as we go. All right, so we're gonna create a new document and then we're gonna call this uh, something that we can kind of get back to easily. So we'll call this um, showcase, let's call this a uh, demo. Learn how to type first, demo, showcase, cool. We're gonna hit okay. And that's just so it's easier for us to find. And then once we come into Arrow before, if you haven't seen this before, or if you haven't worked with 3D programs before, um, Arrow is a 3D program here. So if you look on this uh, bottom right, left-hand corner right here, you'll see the X, Y, and Z axis. So that means that we have not only width and height, but we also have depth which is the Z axis there. Um, we'll be working with kind of a free floating 3D camera whenever you're working with AR. The interesting thing about it is that your audience gets to choose the angle that they view it at. So we kind of have to build with that in mind. Um, to get started though, we have this kind of blank space here. We're gonna go ahead and bring in an asset and kind of walk you around the interface using that asset. So what we're gonna do here is if you if you ha don't have this clicked already, there's this little content button here that looks like a little um, looks like a little a file box. Let's click on that, and then we're under starter assets here. We'll make sure that we have this models section selected, and then let's go ahead and we're gonna go down to directable characters, and we're gonna go ahead and bring in one of these characters here. I'm gonna go ahead and bring in. Fern, and all I have to do is click on him. Oops, I think I brought it in the wrong one. So you can control click, but you can bring in whatever character you like. And here is a Fern. We can zoom in on it just by scrolling. And we have this little character here that we can work with. Um, 
So now that we have this character set up, uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about the interface a little bit. If you look along the left hand side over here, you will see um, a bunch of different tools. You have the regular select tool in a lots of Adobe applications. That's the V tool. I mean, the V key. This kind of lets you, it's kind of like a multi tool. Uh, that's kind of the standard for moving this guy around. So you can click and drag on this character to move it around with uh, V selected. And you can also grab on each one of these little points here. We'll get to this gizmo in a second. Um, but you have the selection tool and then you can limit the tools by pressing E for just the move tool so that you aren't able to rotate it. Uh, pressing R for the rotate tool so all you can do is rotate it. And then pressing S for the scale tool so that all you can do is adjust the scale. The reason why you may want to switch between um, the, the E, R and S keys is if you only want to manipulate one of these um, variables at a time. If you're using just the V key, you have access to all of them through the different um, shaped widgets here. So it kind of depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, what's going to make the most sense? If you just kind of kind of play stuff, uh, the regular V tool is kind of cool because you can click on the character or the object, click on one of these, click on the little square here to scale it up, click on the scale here to square uh, scale it down. And then if you click on the little circle widgets, you can rotate on the um, you can rotate on the x-axis using the red widget. You can rotate on the y-axis using the green widget, and you can rotate on the blue on the uh, z-axis using the blue widget here. Um, but you can see that you might accidentally hit something you didn't intend to hit if you're uh, switching in between all of these different tools here. Um, so using these individual tools may make more sense. So one example where this might make sense is if you were trying to move this. And you can move on the x-axis and the y-axis and the z-axis like this. But if you wanted to move on, um, if you wanted to move on multiple axes at the same time, like moving on y and z at the same time with the individual selected tool uh, with the individual tool selected here, uh, you'll get these corner widgets that will manipulate more than one axis at a time. So there are benefits to moving stuff around that way. So just so that you know, the tools, that multi tool is really great. I'm just hitting control or command Z to undo a few times um, is great for kind of moving things around. But if you want to move, if you want to adjust either um, the position, the scale, or the rotation on multiple axes using the individual tools may make more sense. So like for this, for example, if I wanted to rotate, uh, and the rotation one just gets everything else out of the way and just lets you rotate on the different axes as you need to. So it's the only one that's a little different, but you'll see these little uh, circles to kind of help you get an idea of where you're at in perspective with those tools. Cool. Any questions so far? <laughs> All right, so you'll notice there's a little break here. We have the tools to move an object that we select, right? But below that, we have the tools to move the camera. So um, 3D is always a relationship between the objects that are in front of you and the camera that moves around those objects. Um, so we have this first tool, which is the orbit tool. The orbit tool will move around whatever the center point is as you click and drag or if you're on an iPad looking at it as you kind of pull your finger around, you'll orbit or circle around um, the object or objects that you have selected. The pan tool is uh, number two. These, these are labeled one, two, and three as far as keyboard shortcuts go. Two is the pan tool, and that just allows you to move the camera left and right and up and down from its current position. So think of it like if this was on a tripod, you're moving this, imagine you're raising the legs in this imaginary tripod, lowering the legs on it, or moving it left or right with the pan tool. Okay. And then um, with the third one is Dolly. So um, in cinema, uh, whenever you move a camera forward, um, it's called, uh, and physically move a camera um, towards something, um, it's called dollying. 
Uh, you may have seen like on movie sets and stuff like that, they have like tracks down and the camera moves along those tracks, kind of like a um, train. Uh, the, that's a dolly here. So if I click and drag with dolly, it will basically kind of move the camera in to um, adjust where the, uh, to adjust the camera's perspective here. So um, it's kind of the, it's kind of like a zoom but think of it less as like we are rotating a lens to um, increase how it's magnified and more we're moving the we're physically moving the camera in a constant direction forward cool all right sweet any questions on those tools for rotating or panning or moving around again the if you use arrow a lot keyboard shortcuts one two three and uh, e R S V are can be super helpful, but if you don't use it too terribly often, just click on the ones that you need. It's totally fine. Um, keyboard shortcuts will make you faster in the long run, so it might be worth learning them. Um, so up top here, you'll have above all of this, you'll have the plus button to import. So as you br if you have other three, there are some three D assets in here, but if you bring in your own, or like we'll show later, you bring in a Photoshop document. Um, you can hit the import button to do that, and then it will pull up your standard pick a file to bring in type of uh, screen here. You can see all of the formats that are available here. There are tons of different 3D formats. Uh, you can bring in JPEGs. You can bring in um, Photoshop documents. You can bring in um, even zip folders that can unzip and other things. Um, the, all arrow files are .real files, but there's tons of different things here and lots of different ways you can play. We're really just gonna scratch the surface of what's possible here. Cool. Alrighty. So we already talked a little bit about the content tool here. If it's blue, it's selected. So if I wanted to hide this, I could just click on the content box to remove it. This bottom one right here where there's a little person running is a behavior. We'll get to those in a minute. Um, but let's go ahead and move over to the um, right-hand side here. Um, actually, let's go back to our assets here. We have all of these starter assets um, that are available here, and you can go through different ones. As you do, you'll see there are tables, chairs. You can kind of build your scene out all together. We'll build a small scene in a minute. Um, but as you select these, you'll see there are letters and things like that. Um, but as you go in through your different options here, and our, our page has it listed a little bit better um, visually, but you notice that some have little icons in the bottom right hand side. That means that these have animations that are built into them that were made by whoever created the content that's there. Um, there are a bunch of different, there are a bunch of different elements that have animations built in uh, that are manipulated. And we'll get to how to kind of uh, show off how those work in a minute. But if you see a little icon on the bottom right hand side, that means that there are animations you might be able to use. Um, on the character that I brought in, Fern here, uh, you'll see that there's a little person there. So that means that they have things like walk cycles built in. And we'll talk about how to uh, take advantage of those walk cycles here in just a moment. Cool, any questions so far? Okay. So uh, next up then, we have the actions panel on this right-hand side. So with actions, uh, this is basically when you have an object selected, you will get things like, uh, you'll get options like removing the object or duplicating it or aligning a selection to multiple things or even reverting the selection to the original size here. So if you make something too big, you can hit this button. We'll scale it up and you'll see that this character is actually pretty tall. We scaled them down quite a bit, uh, but you can always undo that. And the reason why that's but that button's there is a lot of the things you're going to use inside of um, a lot of the things that you're going to use that are stock inside of Adobe Arrow are built really well in 3D. But there may be some things that you run into that aren't built so well. So if you scale something up too big or down too small, there may be some polygons because these are all made up of because this character here is just a bunch of 3D kind of shapes and curves that are put together with textures on them. There may be some polygons that like didn't turn out right that don't scale up properly or don't scale down properly. Um, so having the ability to kind of revert to what the original state is may, may save you a little bit or may let you know that maybe I need to find a different asset. But 
Uh, that's why that button exists there. And then bottom right hand side down here, you will see the properties panel. Uh, so a couple of important things to note here, you have things like position, which is how they sit on the X, Y, and Z axis. These are all measured in centimeters because they're built to be in physical space. So um, if you wanted to, and you're creating an experience for a specific space, like a table, you could measure out the table's uh, width and height in centimeters, um, and then set everything up so that it fits perfectly on that table. I'm not going to do that today, but if you were crafting a really, really like specific AR experience in a very, very specific spot, um, because AR works in the real world, you may want to do that. So like if we were at the, we're at the University of Arizona. So like if we were doing a AR experience around a um, statue that maybe was in an open, in a common area there, it may be worth taking measurements of like, how big is that statue? How tall is that statue? And kind of, um, and then building things that are to scale with that statue, if that is the place where they're going to experience that. Um, I hope that we're on one more on campus more. I'd love, I'd love to kind of build and show off that example. So that's definitely on my to-do list. <laughs> um, but you have things like rotation that you can kind of dial in just by clicking and dragging or dialing in a specific value. Um, you can also zero things out pretty easily. And you can scale both size and you have you have size, which is it's um, physical size there, and then scale, which is um, which basically does the same thing as far as this is concerned. Um, but again, just like the better, the more like specific physical size of an object in a space um, is super helpful. Cool. And then one other thing that's kind of interesting is uh, this pivot point here. So you see how we can rotate. Um, if you've worked with Photoshop before, you may have, um, you may have heard of things like, um, you may have heard of terms like anchor points. So uh, the pivot point basically will adjust at this, the part at which this object will rotate here. So the default for a lot of these is bottom, but if I move this to center, when I rotate, it's gonna rotate from the middle of the object here. And while like, maybe that doesn't feel like it has a whole lot of bearing, check this out. If I change the pivot point to the bottom, you'll see that they, if I adjust them the X axis, they're rotating at the feet here, right? So it's like they're, so it's kind of like if their feet were, if your feet were kind of like strapped to a snowboard and we kind of pushed you forward, which sounds awful, <laughs> you would kind of fall, you, uh, you would kind of, your, your point of pivot would be the bottom of these, of the snowboard, right? Um, if we had, if you were on like one of those bouncy thing, like one of those like um, bungee cord jump things that I've seen like at really big shopping centers and things like that. You're more your pivot points more in the center, so you're kind of rotating like around the center of the body there. And then, if you, um, if we put it on the top, then your pivot point would be like if you were like an, an like a top pivot point would be more like like a swing set, right? Like this is more of a movement that you'd have in like a traditional swing set. You're swinging back and forth from that point of pivot, which is above the head there. So depending on how you want to rotate your object or what its center point is, adjusting that um, pivot point can be really handy. Cool. All right. So that's kind of all of the spaces that we have to work in. Uh, did we have any questions on that before we move on? 3D is pretty cool. I like it a lot. And like pivot points let you do a lot of different things. and. Um, as you dig deeper, you can set up different pivot points and different programs, but that's not for this particular workshop because Arrow's a super simple tool. All right, sweet. So we're going to zoom out a little bit, and then we're going to talk about animation because really I think that's what the core of this workshop is about. It's kind of how we animate these things and how we can bring them together. So we're going to go down to our behavior builder. We're going to kind of be living there for the bulk of this workshop. So we go down to the behavior builder here. We're going to add triggers um, and actions. So that's how we create interactivity um, in our, in our, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, in our scene here. So we're going to select this character here, whichever one you selected is fine. 
then we're going to hit trigger. So we have a couple of different options um, that we can work with when we set up triggers here. We have start, which basically means that once, as soon as the AR experience starts, or as soon as somebody loads it in, like these animations will happen. So let's go ahead and hit start here. And then we're going to, and then, so when we start, so we say, okay, we want to start. Now we need to add an action here. This kind of like, um, this, this kind of tells us what the steps that it's going to take once we make an action. So we decided the trigger is start. If we click on action, we'll see a lot of different things. We can play audio. If we have audio files that we can bring in, um, we can spin them around. So let's go ahead and we'll choose spin. Cool. So once we select spin over here on the right hand side, you'll see our properties for spin. We can choose the subject. Turn. See if we have any options for spinning here. We may not because she's a special character, so might not be the best example. But let's say that we did that. <laughs> um, we can come up here and then let's go to play animation. We'll do that. Cool. So we hit play animation. Fern has some built in animations here, and she has quite a few of them. There's dance, enter scene. Fidget. We're going to go and do enter scene because this is, uh, they built this for Fern to kind of come into the scene once it loads up. So let's go ahead and hit enter. Uh, scene here, and then we'll hit this little play button to preview the animation. So Fern looks around. She waves off camera. So since she's waving off camera, maybe we need to rotate her a little bit or him. There we go. Let's rotate Fern there. Let's play it back. There we go, that looks better. <laughs> cool. So this is how Fern's gonna enter the scene and then we'll have that on start, right? So let's go ahead and we'll hit preview here and we'll check that out. Cool. So then Fern, uh, because it's a character that's built this way, she's uh, Fern's gonna sit in, the, in its idle animation. She's gonna kind of keep looking around, that's, um, that's its idle animation. If you've ever like played a video game or seen like a 3D scene where you can kind of just stare at it for a while, idle animations are pretty normal. So it's going to kind of constantly do that idle animation there. Let's go ahead and we will have Fern do something else. So we have it play the starter animation. Then let's add another action here. And then we're going to have it play another animation. And then we will select a different one. So we can choose dance. Let's go ahead and do, we'll do dance. And then we'll hit play to kind of see what dance looks like. Cool. So we have it playing the uh, entering animation here. And then we'll go to play the dance and then We'll see that we have some options down here. We can adjust the speed of the dance. We can adjust how many times that Fern dances. Um, and we can also set it to set Fern to infinitely dance if we want. I want to go ahead and have Fern dance twice. And I'll set the delay here. With no delay, it will just kind of roll into the uh, animation right away. Let's set the delay to two seconds. And we'll hit play. We'll see what it looks like. We'll go back to preview here and we'll kind of see what the whole entire thing looks like and we'll see how it goes. So there's Fern, turns, waves. And then two second delay starts to dance. Sweet. Cool, not bad, right? So because Fern has all these animation built, animations built in, they're there. We're going to go ahead and set Fern to, um, we'll have Fern, we'll lower the delay to like 0.5 seconds. And we'll have Fern dance like maybe three times. So Fern will turn and do that. So then we have that set up, right? We can also set up multiple triggers to have Fern do um, a different set of things when we interact with Fern. So if we go to trigger here, let's go ahead and do 
um, tap. We click on tap here, and this is something that's unique to these characters that have walking animations. We have this uh, option that says move to. So when I hit move to here, then I can set what I want Fern to move to. We could bring in a different object if we wanted, which is cool. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's come down here to our believe directable characters and we'll go to nature and plants and then we'll have Fern walk to this succulent here. So we'll bring in the succulent and then we'll place the succulent wherever we want it to be. Let's say that we want it to be kind of over here. I'm gonna press the space bar to kind of move my camera around and pan. Um, I can orbit if I want with zero to kind of see what that looks like. Press uh, two to pan, move it around. Then we will press V to move this fern just kind of over here. Cool. All right. So now that we have this fern set up, we'll go, and we don't really need an action on the fern. It can just stay there. We're going to go ahead and click on fern again. And then we're going to hit move two once more. And then when we choose location, we'll see that we have some options here. We can set it to the scene anchor, which is the center of the scene here. We can have it move towards the camera, which could be cool if you want something to follow the camera around. But we'll select succulent for now, and then we'll preview it to see how that movement looks. It's gonna kind of show a really short preview of it. Um, so let's go ahead and hit the actual preview button here. And Fern, stand there. And Fern will dance a couple times, which is cool. But we'll notice that once it's that it's not going to, Fern's not going to move towards the succulent here um, until we click or tap on Fern to do so. So let's go ahead and hit that. And then. Fern will make the way all the way over to the succulent here. And let's see what happens. Walks right into the succulent. So maybe we don't want that. <laughs> so let's go ahead and we'll adjust that real quick. So under move two, we will move Fern just a little bit here. Let's see what that looks like. We can just click on Fern to even interrupt those idle animations and see here. If Fern goes into the succulent again too far, there is a way to kind of resolve it that I like a little more. Cool. <laughs> You'll see they'll finish the animation here. The way that we offset that, by the way, um, was under move two. We adjusted the distance between by uh, by the them by a little bit. So if I do like 12 centimeters, let's try that. Hopefully it will make it so the fern doesn't walk into the succulent because succulent is a thing in real space and that there's and there's depth and we don't want fern to kind of climb into it necessarily. Cool. So that works okay. And we're standing we're still kind of standing right outside of it. But I think that there's a better way to do this. Um, and I, I chose the succulent because you can have them map and walk to a thing. But I think that there is a more effective way to accurately place these objects right where you want. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I like that too. And that's because we didn't let the animation complete here. So when we, if we click on Fern, if we click on Fern while Fern's dancing, um, Fern will finish the dancing animation once. Uh, Fern gets where she's going. So uh, what we'll do here now is we'll adjust the move to here. And we're going to talk about um, something that's a little bit more abstract is, uh, than a shape here. So next to location, you'll see a plus button. If I click on the plus, plus button, that's going to add a pin. The pin will drop kind of arbitrarily in front of a space. But if we click on the pin, we'll notice that it has the same X, Y, and Z movement. 
uh, that everything else has. And with this pin, we can a bit more precisely place where we want Fern to land. So if I select right there, I move the pin, then I click back on Fern, and then I adjust the move to point to the pin. And then I'm not super interested in um, adjusting the distance between it because that's exactly where I want Fern to land. I'm going to, uh, we can adjust the delay here, but let's go ahead and hit the preview. And now when I tap on Fern, Fern will immediately walk over to the pin that I've set up and I can see the pin right there. Cool. So that pin will allow me to better kind of place Fern where I want Fern to land. Cool. And Fern's just going to stand there. Uh, we can go back in. And if we wanted to adjust the animation here, maybe we want Fern to always dance. We can set that to infinite. And then if we preview it again, Fern's going to say hi, then Fern's going to dance. Cool. I'll have Fern kind of move the way over to the point. And then we'll have Fern dance. And Fern will just stand there and dance for as long as Fern wants. Cool. <laughs> and the reason why Fern kind of stops because we have the delay on there. So if we turn off the delay and then um, let's have Fern move a little faster here. So under the move to, we can adjust the speed. And Fern should move over there a bit faster now. Once we select, we'll let Fern wave and say hello. We'll click on Fern. And you see that as we adjust the speed, because it's kind of dynamic, if we set it really high, Fern will almost sprint. And then Fern will dance. Cool. Fern is fast. <laughs> but any questions so far? So um, a lot of these built-in animations will really help you um, create movement inside of a scene, which is pretty cool. Um, so and then the other trigger that's available for us is enter proximity so just like the places that you put on a scene the camera has an x y and z axis as well so that when your camera moves to a specific point something will happen here so let's try that out with this succulent actually move the succulent off just a little bit i'm going to add a trigger we'll call it enter proximity we'll make it perform an action and then we'll make it kind of grow We'll have it scale. So if we go to scale here, we can adjust the scaling and we'll have it grow maybe under scale multiplier. We'll go ahead and have it scale to be maybe two times as big. Let's see what it looks like. And maybe we're trying to make it emphasize itself once we get close or something like that. Um, and then when we have enter proximity set up, we can set what that proximity is in centimeters based off the camera here. So let's go ahead and have, we'll have the camera get like within 10 centimeters here and we'll see what that looks like. If we go to preview, we will orbit and then we'll move the camera in. Once we get close enough, you'll see that this kind of grows and gets bigger and Fern's still doing their thing. Come Fern, it'll run, she'll run over. And we'll see that we have it set up to where every time that we get, uh, get closer, it scales bigger. So maybe that's not what we wanted. <laughs> so if we go back to scale here, we can set this to back and forth. And let's see what that does. Oops. Let's zoom out. Let this go back in. Oh, just keeps getting bigger. Interesting. 
So maybe scale is not the thing you want to do with proximity. <laughs> maybe a click is smarter for that. So let's set this to under enter proximity here. We'll click do tap. Let's see how it behaves. Okay, it's just gonna scale forever. That's cool. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> maybe that's not exactly what we need here. Um, and maybe that's better for like an automatic action just to do once. But you get the idea. There are other things that we can do here aside from scale. So if we have it spin, for example, maybe that's a little better. The thing we have this spin around, do a little twirly. Maybe trigger it so it can kind of dance with Fern. Kind of fun. You can get to control that. Sorry, I hit a button and zoomed out pretty far. But you can have these kind of interactables that we can click on or move into. So kind of cool. Awesome. Making sense so far? Any questions? All righty. So now. Let's talk about building the showcase part of this. Um, I really, one of the cool things that Arrow can do is it can allow you to place 2D objects in 3D space and kind of set them up so that they are um, presented to your viewer in a way that's pretty easy for them to see. Um, there are tons of different applications to this, everything from literally showcasing a, uh, something that you're working on to um, creating educational elements that um, educational elements that can be used in classes and stuff like that and even remotely for people through a link on their phone. Um, so let's go ahead and we will I'll show you kind of how you might get started doing that. So uh, if you're using your own assets you'll go to the import window here but because we are using our internal assets we'll go to um our we'll go to our contents page and we'll click on this little guide to get to images and then we'll go to layered illustrations here so these layered illustrations are photoshop documents um that we can kind of manipulate and work with to um either show the depth of a photoshop document or add some depth to what we're doing here so let's go ahead and we will grab this nature, um, this nature illustration here. And then if we zoom in on it and we, and we orbit around just a little bit, we'll see that this is kind of, um, this is all very, very flat. If we turn to the side here, there's no depth to it. Um, and so this is a Photoshop document, all of the, all the layers are flat, um, but there's some things that we can do to kind of give this some depth and even maybe have some things happen inside of it. So if we click on the selection tool here, click on the layer, and then we'll go down to um, under properties, we'll see that we have a new option called layer spacing here. So because this is a Photoshop document, it's a bunch of different layers, so we can adjust spacing. I'm gonna go ahead and offset the angle just a little bit here. So it'll be a little bit easier to see. So we can adjust the layer spacing in the X, Y, or Z space here. So if I adjust it on X, we'll see these things kind of slide apart, right? These are all different layers here. If we fan them out far enough, and I zoom out a little bit, We'll see that we have one, two, three, four. I think it looks like it's either three or four layers here um, that we can adjust on the x axis. It looks like four layers. We can adjust it on the y axis, so how deep it is if we wanted to kind of separate like that. But um, I think x and z are probably the best to use. Oh, I adjusted size going to layer spacing. I like z because it gives us some depth here. And the cool thing about this, and I think it's even cooler, like when you use a phone, is that like 
when you're previewing it, you can kind of walk through and look around the scene here, which is super cool. Um, and then we can even have things interact with that. So if I come over here and this is why orbit is so great for placing stuff. I can move the orbit a little bit further um, vertically so I can kind of get a bird's eye view of what's going on. And then I can place things in here that will help bring this to kind of life. So I'm gonna go back to my assets here. Oops, oh, I went back to edit. I can still orbit back up, cool. And um, this kind of, I'll call it isometric. I'm not sure if it's, 100% correct here, but you can kind of see this cube isometrically, this kind of isometric angle I really like for placing things. So with this 2G object kind of blown up, I'm gonna to go to my starter assets again, and we're gonna kind of populate this with some animals here. I'm building this on the fly, by the way, I don't really kind of just figure it out as we go. So, <clears throat> which is one of the kind of cool things about Arrow is that we have this ability to kind of, what's in our mind and what can we kind of build? Uh, especially with these kind of pre-built assets here. I have all of these little origami forest creatures here that have animations built in that I will trigger. So let's go ahead and use those. I'm gonna bring in a hummingbird here. Hummingbird looks like it might be kind of fun in the front. So I'll click and drag it. I'll click it, to, whoops, I brought in a little water thing here. So I'll click on the hummingbird. Hummingbird shows up right there, it's kind of big. We'll start by kind of moving it forward. We'll rotate it. We'll scale it down a little bit. The size here. Again, just kind of get a general placement. We can orbit the camera a little bit. Oops, hit one to orbit. And then, uh, so we're starting. To, so we're starting to get into a point where we have multiple layers and multiple things going on, <clears throat> and. Maybe clicking on them in the physical space might not be the most reliable way to make a choice. So if we come over here to our scene, if you've used Photoshop before, this behaves like layers inside of Photoshop here. So I have the surface, the fern, the hummingbird, and I go ahead and click on the hummingbird that selects it for me. And then I can just click and drag using these tools here. Cool. And I can rotate it. Um, and again, like I can rotate using any of these here. I'll rotate the x-axis just a little bit and I'll scale it down using the scale tool here. Again, this is just more simple for me. Cool. I'm gonna add a trigger, start, because I know it has animations here. I'm gonna go ahead and hit play animation. The animation set is hummingbird. If I hit hummingbird, we'll see the hummingbird kind of moves around, which is super cool. Um, and I'll set that and I'll see it's like a six second animation. I can set this to infinite here. Then when I get a preview of this, now you'll see that with this flat image, with this flat Photoshop document here, I can add a little bit of life to it. And give my viewers something interesting to kind of look at while they're looking at all of my other stuff. And really this blending of like 2D and 3D is really where I think this program and like AR really has the ability to kind of be a transformative experience here. So let's go ahead and add a few more pieces. I got an owl. And again, we'll kind of do the same thing. Um, I'm just gonna kind of talk as I, as I work here. Um, <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit one to rotate, bring it up. Using those pre-built animations, yeah, like that's so cool. I'm so glad you guys, I'm so glad y'all like it. Whoops, Siri was talking to me. Um, so glad you guys like it. it. It is one of those things where really it's about kind of building stuff here and kind of building these kind of mixed media types of projects and just getting them in front of people, which is really cool. And the nice thing is when I'm done with this, I can send you a code where you can play this in your own space and try it out for yourself. So let's go ahead and go with trigger. We'll go with tap this time. We we'll go to action, we we'll go to play animation. Then we'll look at what this owl setting looks like here. Owl's in a 
kind of fly around. It's just flutter. Okay, that works. We'll go to preview. Well, so the owl looks like it's sitting in the tree there. And yeah, you'll break it when you rotate, but it's one of those kind of cool things to for them to kind of pick the angle that you want them to see. Sometimes you'll kind of want it to be able to be kind of manipulated like that. And we'll see this really cool animation. They can kind of look behind it and see what we're doing and how we're doing it. So love it. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and I will bring in um, a couple squirrels. It's a really big squirrel. And then we will rotate one time. All right. Move that over here towards the back. Because the idea is, like, like I said, you have to kind of remember here, and I know I've said it a few times already, that we're kind of building a scene that people can look at, which is cool. Um, but they're, they're also going to have the ability to kind of zoom in and like physically move themselves to see the parts that they want to see. Um, so maybe adding, using these kind of pre-made things to add a little bit of depth can be cool um, and allow them to kind of find Easter eggs themselves. Uh, which is what I always like. So we'll play this animation and see how it looks, make sure that the squirrel's not running into anything, which is cool. Cool. So that works for me. We're going to go ahead and make this infinite here. Play. Sweet. So now that I've done this work, what I can do here is I can take this squirrel, then I can duplicate it, create another squirrel, Move the squirrel over here somewhere, maybe. So I have a couple different squirrels running around. I'll rotate it a little bit. Um, and then I will set this to infinite, but I will switch. I'll put in a little bit of a delay so that they're kind of moving at different times. So like 0.3 seconds here. Then I will duplicate it one more time. Maybe put a squirrel up in front because they don't need to be in the sunset, I don't think um this little image here um and then we will set this delay once i select it here under play animation i'll set this delay to 0.4 but i'll adjust the playback speed to be just a little faster so like 1.2 you can adjust whatever you want let's do it two times as fast just for fun cool then if i go to preview this I would argue that this scene is kind of a bit more alive than it might have been beforehand. We kind of look through and see all these different things, kind of play with it. If clickable elements, let's not forget about our character here that can kind of walk through. <laughs> we might want to adjust how far it is sitting there, but we have this whole entire scene that they can play with here. And this is a really, really simple kind of um this is a really really simple kind of thing that we built here i really like this um i really like this hummingbird here and i think it adds a whole lot to this but it kind of like the squirrels i think it'd be nice to have one more maybe a little bit further back um so we can do that so i can again at this point there's a lot going on so i'll select the hummingbird here i'll duplicate and I will move the hummingbird all the way over here. Move it towards the back. I'll rotate a little bit. And then just so that it doesn't, because if I go ahead and preview this, like it's gonna look kind of robotic because they're it's gonna look like they're synchronized, like they're synchronized, because they are. So let's go ahead and adjust that synchronization a little bit so that it feels like it's more natural. So if you select this, and then we go to our, uh, make sure that you have the behaviors turned on, play animation. Um, we can adjust the speed here. So I'll have this one fly a little faster just to kind of offset it a little bit. 
And if I preview it, you see they kind of look like they're darting individually and you can kind of play with it even more to dial it in how you want. Sweet. <laughs> and Fern, like, like, like Alex said, is over there and still kind of grooving. But does this process make sense more or less? Any questions about what we've covered so far? Awesome. All righty. Cool. So what we're going to do now um, is just to kind of show off this option here, I'm going to go ahead and bring in this little origami sun here. And I'll switch to one where we're kind of closer to being finished with the project, but brought in this little origami sun. Should I adjust this so that it's a little bit easier to see uh, what I'm working with? Then I'm going to adjust the position of this using the move section here. Scale it. I'm going to kind of move it to be in line with this background, I suppose. You could use whatever you wanted. Um, if you found like a sun asset that you really liked, you could work with it. I'm going to adjust the pivot point to center because pivoting at, at the center of this makes more sense for a sun than pivoting at the bottom of it, which is, this is actually a pretty, I think, decent example of how these pivot points work. So when I rotate from there, so, especially on the x-axis, like the sun doesn't swing, would not swing like that. I guess if you had like a mobile or something like that that you're trying to emulate, maybe that would be cool. Um, but I really want this to rotate from its center point. I can scale it down. This is all stuff you can play with and like super, super simple like physics types of things. Like where would something rotate if it were just kind of like, if it were suspended in air or what have you? You can kind of think of that stuff as you're working. So I'm going to go ahead and put the sun back here. Maybe have it kind of peek up in front of those clouds. And I want to show you one other trigger that I think is super cool. Um, I'm going to go to start, action, and then I would like this to follow. And I want this sun to follow the camera so that it's always kind of forward facing here. Because if I rotate around the sun, I don't really want you to see like this, these simple polygons in the back. I always kind of want the sun to be facing you for whatever reason in this particular application. But you can do this with anything that you want to be facing your viewer. So under follow, set the center point to what makes sense for it because this will rotate pitch and shift and move around. Um, and then I will set the subject to be the sun. And then I would like this to follow the camera. I think I should be able to do that. All right. Maybe it doesn't like something I did. There we go. Um, so we'll follow here. This is a beta. Oh, sorry. Aim. That's what I meant. Aim. Aim will point it at something. So we're going to have it aim at. In order to choose the target, and the target is going to be the camera here. Sorry, I got that wrong. It's aim. So when I go to preview, we'll zoom out. That looks cool. But you'll see that as I rotate, the sun will always follow you. So maybe that's not 100% what you want with the sun, but the idea is that if you had something that either had geometry that you didn't need people to see or you wanted something always looking at you, you could do that pretty easily there with the aim tool. Cool. Making sense so far? Any questions here? Hopefully we still got everyone. Pretty cool, right? Awesome. So now that we've kind of built this out, um, when we're ready to share it. It's pretty easy to do. We can hit the share button over here on the right hand side. We can create a link. That gives you the approximate size of this. We can also export this out as a dot real file if we were handing this off to somebody else to work with. But I can copy this and paste it in the chat. And then you can try this out yourself. 
Um, and you'll download the Arrow app on your mobile device or the Arrow Reader Viewer app. And then you can open this up, set up the ground floor and set up your experience in your own space. Cool. So that's essentially like what we'll be doing to kind of build these experiences out is playing with those. Uh, what questions did we have before I show you one that's a little bit more complex and then show you how you can bring in your own, um, you can bring in your own elements here to kind of customize an experience to be what you want it to be. Give that a moment. Cool. All right. So moving on then, I'm going to go ahead and kind of like a cooking show, I pre-prepared something that's a little bit more complex, but it uses every element that I showed you. So if I go back to the home screen here, I'll go to my work, and I will open up this um, showcase copy here, showcase. Cool. Take a moment to load. And then I have this, I have this, it's a little... It's not too, it's not much more complex, but we do have a few things going on here. Got T-Rex, has something with multiple animations and triggers on it. Um, let's go ahead and we'll preview this. And we'll see, I have this little city scene here, but if I zoom in, kind of like before I had things interacting with it, people walking across the street, like maybe have a car kind of going around. If I zoom out a little bit more, you can see that I added this little, this little squid fella kind of going around the city. And, and all these were like multiple things that I, these are some of these have multiple animations built in. Like if I click on this, when I click on the, when I click on this character here, what's happening, it'll kind of move out of the way. Like it's reacting to being poked. We've got T-Rex over here. We could add other stuff. Um, and then I have a couple of different objects here that you can kind of look at and go through. Uh, these are just, if I rotate the camera here, actually. These are just um, different elements that I have. So I have to do a few different things. I have this kind of ornament over here that we can kind of go through and see the different layers. Cool. And then I have this little object right here that will take me to a website. Um, so let's talk about how we did that. One of the triggers that we have, if we go to the edit menu here and go to our behaviors and we click on this Adobe Arrow one thing here, it's a Photoshop layer. So I think I offset the X spacing by quite a bit. So let me go get that back down to zero. Cool. And if I zoom in on it, And then I'll orbit down just a little bit. Let's see, this is an object here. And then I have a couple of different triggers on it. I have the spin trigger set up when we start to just kind of rotate around as we're kind of going through the experience there. We'll see that there's depth in the different layers. It's a Photoshop document. Um, and then my, trap, my tap trigger says open URL. So AR experiences are super cool and they can be kind of a great way to promote something. But you can also use the URL trigger to like put in a call to action here. So I put like, want to learn more about Adobe Arrow? Click on, they can they touch on it and then it will take them to, um, if my, if my web browser is there. So if I get a preview and I tap on it, It'll take them to adobe.arizona.edu to learn more or wherever I want. So AR can kind of be a neat little promotional tool as well. So let's talk about how we did this here. So we used Photoshop to do that. Um, so we're going to jump into Photoshop real quick. Photoshop. Cool. And then once we launch Photoshop here, I'll pull up the Photoshop document here to show you what we did and how we did it. So we go to file, open. These are all cloud documents, but the thing that I have is saved to my, my workshop thing here. So if we go to arrow, 
with this open. And if you're going to add text, there are individual text blocks that you can add here. Um, under the 3D assets here, there are letters. But pulling in each letter individually to kind of build the word you want can be a little bit taxing. Um, so I like using Photoshop to create a document here with transparency on it. Um, and then I added, this is just white text with like a little outline on it. You could do a drop shadow and things like that. But one of the reasons why I like the white on black here or the black on white is because you don't know how people are gonna be previewing this. We're looking at this in this kind of virtual environment, but you'll see in a minute when I switch over to, I'm showing you this on an iPad, although it will kind of run a little slow you'll see that your backgrounds vary a little bit. So having something that's easy to read, like white with a black outline or black with a white outline or something with some sort of outline or something to differentiate text to make it easier for you to see it um, in multiple spaces. Because maybe you don't know where they're gonna be viewing the content that you have. Um, but anyway, these are a bunch of different layers here. And just like that image of the um, forest or the city that we have, the layers being separated is what we're going to be able to manipulate to create depth. Um, but if you wanted this to be a flat image, you could totally do it this way here. You'll see we have a little Adobe Creative Campus logo here as well. Um, and then I saved that out. Uh, and now I don't want to save that. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this from the screen so I can just kind of show you how to get it from jump here. We click the plus button to import. You'll navigate to wherever it is. This is under my documents under Arrow Workshop. You can save yours wherever you want. I'm going to click it, it's going to open up, and then it shows up kind of on our screen there. Again, I really like selecting the, um, the element in the scene window here because it behaves like layers in Photoshop. And I can move it up and maybe move it forward if I wanted to kind of put it where I want it. And then to set up the triggers here, We'll do a start trigger. I kind of liked the rotation. Um, I want it to rotate. Um, we'll have it kind of, we have a number of different things you can do. I think I had spin set up actually. I'll go spin there. So again, to switch it, we'll go to spin. Just because it's a little bit easier. Um, to because spin's going to be a 360. This is probably too fast. Let's try it out just for fun. We got to preview it. That's not super helpful. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> we'll go ahead and we'll change this to like 10 seconds. And then, um, just to kind of show you here, I'll actually change it to three because it'll take forever if I do 10. If I do three seconds here, do you see how this kind of like comes to a stop and then restarts? Um, this is using ease, easing in and easing out, which is a um, which under this easing menu here. That's great for things that move naturally, but this I kind of want to be like a spinning marquee that doesn't ever stop, like it's mechanical, um, like um, like a Route sixty six, um, like automated kind of like sign for a restaurant or something like that that just kind of spins like in, per in perpetuity. So I'll change the easing to linear. Uh, so that it kind of just continues to spin normally, like without ever kind of like resetting. It's kind of a constant spin, right? And that works for this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and set the easing here to linear, and then I'll adjust the duration to like 10 seconds. Then I'll set it to infinite like it is, and then it just kind of spins like that. Um, and I'll go back to edit, then I will add a trigger so that on tap, we set the action to open URL and keep in mind, you can always adjust this action right here to whatever you want. And then you'll just pop in the URL there. So adobe.arizona.edu, but it can be whatever you wanted. Um, and then once that's set, we can set multiple ones. Um, we can even set multiple triggers to happen at the same time. I believe I did that with this guy right here. So 
we'll see right here that I have a couple of different things going here. I actually have three. Uh, so I have this play animation here. And the animation for this is really cool. Like it's super fluid. Let me get a little closer here. So if I hit play animation, this little kind of like mechanical floating squid thing is happening, right? So I stack that, this is under just start here. So I stack that looping infinitely with this orbit here that loops infinitely. And you'll see that if I preview it, it just kind of spins around here. But if I, but if I did that, even if it was doing that fluttering thing, um, it doesn't ever, like I don't see any change in the pitch there. So like it, it would look like it was just kind of fluttering one direction, which would be um, not the best. Actually, let me duplicate that and I'll show you. Hopefully this is interesting. I think it's super cool. <laughs> um, and actually, this is a good time to show off another feature that you have. You have the ability to hide and show options here, just like in Photoshop. So you can hit the little eyeball here to hide that jellyfish layer altogether if you didn't want it. So let me go ahead and I will show you what this would look like if I didn't have this rotate on here. So I'm going to select it and delete it. I'll go to preview. If I didn't have that rotate turned on on this, then you'll see it just kind of, while it's cool that it's moving around, there's no motivation to like how it gets back to where it does. It's like, it's like um, it's stuck in this kind of whirlpool that's just moving it independently and it really doesn't have any control over its own trajectory here. So what I did to kind of mimic that and you don't have to get this involved. This stuff is cool to me and I have a good time with it. <laughs> so um, what I did to, I'll go ahead and hide this one, show the one that I finished, is I added a rotate here. So let's check out the rotate on its own. So see that like over five seconds here, it rotates from left to right and then back again. So if we combine this animation with this orbit and this rotation. And again, it's timed here. I knew that this was 10 seconds here. So I wanted to kind of tilt this way for five seconds. Then when it hits the back, it tilts the other way for five seconds and comes back. So it's set to infinite. Um, I have the ease in and ease out. So it kind of smoothly transitions back. And, and then I have back and forth turned on so that it tips to one side, then tips back. And then when that's all together, that does this, which is super cool, I think. Awesome. OK. So I'm going to go ahead, and I'd love to share this with you here. So I'll create a link so you can try it. And then I'll jump on the iPad here and show you kind of, you know, it'll be like the frames will be pretty limited because we are kind of doing this wirelessly, um, but I'll show you what it looks like in a real space. So let me go ahead and paste that there so you can try it yourselves. Let me go ahead and share my iPad screen here and then I'll show you how this would set up on the iPad and we'll kind of walk around it. And then um, we'll answer any questions that we have and then we'll call it a day. So let me go ahead and wake this guy up. Sorry, one moment. All right. Arrow is trying to load on my iPad. There we go. Boom. So let that open. Go ahead and share my iPad here. And there will be a little bit of a delay, I think. Um, it's over airplay there. Cool. And we will mirror our screen. Cool. 
All right. So we'll let this load. Copy. So when you have your scene here, you'll have to place it. So if you've never used Arrow before, this little thing will kind of detect the ground for you, or in this case, my desk, which is a little messy. So sorry about that. And then you can uh, select an anchor to kind of place this. So I'll place this kind of right here. This little pin will say where we land it. So I'm going to go ahead and drop it right there. And there's my scene. Hopefully, you all can see it. And then we kind of move in and kind of take a look at individual elements. If this doesn't freeze up altogether, there we go. Um, and then when we tap on one of these, we have all of the editing features that we had before, which have them on the mobile version. So you can totally create an entire experience right from your device here. But if I zoom in just a little bit, <clears throat> you can kind of see how having that separated here makes it a little bit easier to read all over the different spaces, right? But if I go to preview, this is kind of what it looks like. And I know it's gonna be kind of choppy for y'all, but that's hopefully you can see that spinning and this little guy moving around. And if I come down here, we can see the little characters in the street moving across the crosswalk and doing their thing. If I come over here, this is really where that kind of separation of layers comes into play. So you can see that and I can kind of physically move my camera through it and kind of look around and kind of experience this myself, how I kind of want to see it. I mean, that for your users there is really kind of where the rubber hits the road and where this gets really cool. And again, I can tap on this to learn more. I can kind of come in and look at the city. Um, I can kind of come around and see the elements going on like behind there, take a look closer look at the dinosaur and all of that stuff. So super cool. Um, and again, I have the share button up here on the top right hand side where I can share a link or export this out altogether. But everything that I showed you inside of um, inside of Arrow on the desktop is a, is a more available and um, a bit more even a bit more stable than it is on the um, desktop here. So because Arrow was initially built for mobile devices to work on. But uh, I was wondering, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, I don't think that there are, but were there any questions I could answer or anything I can go over? We have about 10 minutes to kind of answer any questions that you have. I hope that this was a good kind of introduction to how you can build these types of experiences inside of Arrow. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so glad that you liked it, Charlene. Um, the, the last thing that I'll say, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, the last thing that I'll say is that these are pretty simple Photoshop documents and things like that. And, um, you kind of want to be mindful of where you're placing things. If you want this perspective view that like things like these streets are doing but if you just had something that had a bunch of different layers in it and you just want to kind of allow people to walk through and kind of explode them out like that's also a really good use for this like i think that uh, stuff like this little design right here is a great example of it it's a great way to just kind of let people see how something's made um you could do like five or six different pictures here the other really cool thing that you can do here i know that i did a bunch of animated stuff with 3D objects, but if you've if you've done a bunch of like if you have a bunch of uh, PNGs or TIFFs or GIFs, you can bring those in, and those are triggerable and animatable in space here. Um, on if you want to see kind of a good example of that, I believe on the Spark page that we shared, there is a pretty cool tail end if it's if it's not there i will add it um dunway smith's youtube channel she's a she's a like multi um, media artist 
she has some really good tutorials about how you can take things that you may have built inside of a Premiere Pro or an After Effects or how to get video animations to play back inside of Arrow in a way that's dynamic. Um, it's super cool stuff. There's just, there's just so much that can be done here and this application is constantly being modified. So um, if you like the space, it's a, I, I love it. It's a cool space to play in. And I think that uh, there's some awesome uses for it, but yeah, just want to make sure that you had some more resources to be able to kind of go deeper and learn more. But I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. My name has been Brian. Uh, thanks for hanging out and we'll see you in another workshop.